right, here we go. Good evening. Welcome to Anchor Church. I'm glad that you are here. Those of you that are online, we got some folks in the room here that still haven't made it in, but they'll make it in shortly. I'm glad you're with us. We're going to continue going through our study in Genesis. We'll see how far we get. I've got notes for several chapters tonight, and we'll just pass the time and get to a good stopping place when we get there. So until then, uh, let's find a, a good place to start heard a song one time in the movie that said if you start at the beginning that's a very good place to start so we're going to look at chapter 18 of Genesis I'm going to read tonight in sections and we will go from there uh, just a section at a time through this chapter and chapter 19 and maybe even into 20 if we make it that far before we do that let's go to the Lord in prayer I'm going to go ahead and pray and we will move from that point Lord thank you this evening for the chance to be here with your people for the chance to to look at your word and study it together and to hear what you would say to us through it. I pray that you'll be with us this evening throughout this service, that you'll be glorified and all that you want to get accomplished will get accomplished. Let us hear what you would have us hear. Let me speak well and speak what you would have me speak. And let us walk out of here changed and more equipped to do the work of the kingdom because we spent time in your presence and time with one another. In your name we pray. Amen. So let's start in Genesis chapter 18 tonight. I'm going to look at the first eight verses as our first section so we'll read those and then I will move forward as we go and just uh, for those of you online that may or may not be aware I'm adjusting the camera uh, <laughs> you're probably aware of that I am uh, I am not feeling 100% tonight um, I ate something that did not agree with me and I've been struggling this evening so if I seem a bit out of sorts uh, that's why if I'm not holding a microphone and I'm trying to sit oddly it's because I'm trying to sit comfortable but let's not let that distract tonight I just want you to understand uh, why what you're seeing looks a little different than usual. So, enough of that. Genesis 18, I'm going to read verses 1 through 8, and we are going to go from there tonight. The Lord appeared to Abraham at the oaks of Mamre while he was sitting in the entrance of his tent during the heat of the day, and he looked up and he saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the entrance of the tent to meet them and bowed to the ground, and he said, My Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, please do not go past your servant. Let a little water be brought and you may wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree, and I will bring a bit of bread so that you may strengthen yourselves. This is why you have passed your servant's way. Later you can continue on. Yes, they replied, do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent and said to Sarah, Quick, knead three measures of fine flour and make bread. Meanwhile, Abraham ran to the herd and got a tender choice calf, and he gave it to a young man who hurried to prepare it. And then Abraham took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared, and he set them before the men, and he served them as they ate under the tree. So you may remember last week we looked at uh, what was a bit of a difficult section of Genesis. We looked at the result of, again, some mistakes that Abraham had made, but we also saw the blessing of the Lord reiterated because now he has changed the name of his servant from Abram to Abraham and from Sarai to Sarah. So now we're going to be using the names we're most familiar with for these people in Scripture because we've reached that point in chapter uh, seven, 16 and 17 where that happened. And now we find ourselves in verse 18, or ch verses 1 through 8 of chapter 18, where the Lord visites, 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 <laughs> visited Abraham again. This is the third time that Abraham has seen the Lord in person. The other two times were in Genesis 12, 7, where he says, I will give this land to your offspring. And the other was in, ch in uh, chapter 17, as God establishes the covenant of circumcision and changes Abraham and Sarah's names. We just saw that last week. So the Lord has visited Abraham now. This is the third time he appears to him in person. Now let's consider Abraham for a minute. We've been looking at this for several chapters, for several weeks, this journey of Abraham from the time he receives the promise to the moment we see him at today where he gets this third visit from the Lord. And we've already seen that he is far from perfect. He is frequently making mistakes. He is frequently falling short of the perfection of the Lord. And yet Abraham still, can, or Abraham still continues to be visited by God. God continues to speak to him, and God has several times reaffirmed his promises to Abraham. And the reason he's done that, we've seen again and again, is because Abraham has been faithful. He's returned again and again to the Lord despite the number of mistakes that he's made, despite the times that he has failed, despite the times that he's been less than perfect. He's returned again and, to the, again, and again to the Lord, and it's not just that he has come back again and again saying, oh, I need God like I need 911 service. Oh, God, I've committed the same sin again. Oh, God, I'm repeatedly having to come back to you to ask you for something I want. 
He's actually come back to the Lord with a good attitude. His intentions have always been good. He's made some human mistakes, and he has remained teachable and humble in the presence of the Lord. And he's been committed to doing whatever the Lord said to make things right. He has several times in the course of this study, we've, we've found the final, the final verse of a section or of a chapter being, Abraham went and did as God instructed. Abraham's teachable, committed, and humble, and he is faithful. There's a lot of people that look at the life of someone like Abraham, and they would say, gosh, you keep screwing everything up. And of all the people that would make a mistake like that, why you? You've spoken to God in person, which at this point in time was not common. You've spoken to God in person. He gave you some great promises. He's been faithful and delivered you from some things that you should not have survived. How in the world could you keep making mistakes? How could you keep screwing, screwing up? How could you keep going back to using drugs again and again, to lying and again and again, to stealing, to sinning, to, to, to living with that person you're not married to? How could you keep returning to sins again and again? How is it that you didn't become perfect the first time you were in the presence of God? You probably caught that I've made the leap here from just talking about Abraham's life to taking a look at our own lives because we look at people and we say, how is it that you came to the Lord and yet you're not perfect and you're not restored and you're not healed? How can you call yourself a man of God if you are not completely and perfectly healed and restored after your encounter with him because you've spent time in his presence? The truth is that is a process and God views faithfulness and righteousness differently than we do. There are never excuses for sin, but God sees the whole picture and he looks at Abraham and says, this is a man who is teachable, humble, and faithful to, to return and make right what has been done wrong in his life. That is a faithful, righteous man in the eyes of the Lord. We can't look at people and make judgment calls on them because they have not matured enough, have not grown enough, are not as complete in Christ as we think they should be at the, in a certain period of time. In fact, we, we have to take a look at ourselves and say, if in fact I have done what I think is arriving in the Lord and I have, I have got all sin out of my life and I am doing everything as well as I'm supposed to and I'm, I'm listening to the Lord, I'm praying and I'm reading, I'm doing all the things I'm supposed to do and my life has become stagnant, if I've reached a place where I am just in stasis with the Lord and I'm not growing, last I checked, growing or living things grow. If I'm not growing and progressing, if I'm not continually becoming more sanctified internally to match what people see externally, perhaps I've got a bigger problem than someone like Abraham or, like a rec or someone who's a recovering addict or someone who's only been a Christian for six weeks and doesn't have their life in order and still seems to have sin in their life. Perhaps the bigger problem is with me because if that person is continuing to grow and they're, they're drawing closer to the Lord and they're making progress in becoming more Christ-like while I say I'm just going to maintain because I think I've got it together, there's a very good chance that that person, when you hold them up against a standard of someone like Abraham, they may have more righteousness and be more faithful than you are if you're not growing and progressing in the Lord. God looks at Abraham and sees something different. He doesn't see a man who, I've been in your, you've been in my presence several times and you keep screwing up. He looks at him and says, this is a faithful man because he is correctable and he is willing, and he continually picks himself up and comes back to me to make right what is wrong. So Abraham has been visited by God again. It says in verse 2 of this passage, he looked up and saw three men. Now, I find this fascinating. A good friend of mine I'm in a Bible study with on Thursdays said something interesting. He said, it would be good sometimes if you would just read the Bible the way it's written and not take someone else's word for it because you may see or read something in a way that you haven't before. And this happened with me in this passage when I was looking at it preparing for this study tonight. You remember in Genesis when God said, let us make man in our image. And we talked about God and whether or not he was talking to himself and we talked about the fact that previously through all of these chapters that we've read in Genesis so far, we have seen the Holy Spirit and we've seen references and parallels to Jesus and we've talked about the Godhead. There's more than one interpretation of this verse that exists in commentaries and most of them say this was the Lord with two angels, which I believe is the most accurate one because when we get to the next chapter, we see that it says the angels had moved on to the next town. We'll get there. 
But it was still interesting to see a trinity, a group of three men, three separate entities that came, and Abraham looks at them and says, Lord. Regardless of which interpretation is accurate here, the idea that we recognize the trinity repeats in Scripture so many times. And here Abraham recognizes the Lord and he behaves as an ideal host in the presence of the Lord, offering the refreshment and the rest to the visitors that have come into their home. When is the last time that you welcomed the Lord into your life and into your home? Are you simply living your life the way that you think is best, the way that you've interpreted Scripture, the way that you think I should live in order to be a good person, and you're waiting until you have a time that you need God to call him to come by to attend to something that you need in your life? Or have you simply just watched and paid attention and left the door open so that he feels welcome when he comes? Abraham's got the attitude of a good host, and he recognizes these three men. That's the Lord. And he immediately is hospitable and is an ideal host. When's the last time you hosted the Lord? How prepared are are you to host the Lord if he were to appear unexpectedly, whether that be the end of time or whether that be a specific incident in your life where he deems it necessary to make an appearance in your life? Are you prepared for that? Abraham, with no notice whatsoever, becomes an ideal host and offers the Lord what the Lord should receive, respect, honor, glory, refreshment, and rest in his home and then in verse 3 look at the language that Abraham uses to address the Lord if I have found favor in your sight then let me serve you I'm paraphrasing here obviously but he says if I found favor in your sight let me do these things for you too often what we say when we talk to the Lord is oh Lord you're so great oh Lord we love you so much and while I've got you here since I've done these things for you can you do a thing for me Lord, if I do this thing for you that I think you've asked me to do, what will you do for me? Abraham does not begin the conversation by saying, I have done, or will you do, or if I do this. He simply says, if I have found favor in your sight, what can I do for you, not since I've done, what can you do for me? In fact, he uses that same approach again in verse 5. He says, this is why you've come this way. You have come so I can serve you. We have lost this mentality in too many churches and in the hearts of too many Christians that I live as a servant of the Most High God. And we've disguised it and wrapped it up as something else. We have disguised it and wrapped it up in this idea that, well, these good things happen to me because I serve well, or if I serve well, there will be good things that happen to me. But Abraham is not looking for anything more than the opportunity to serve the Lord. This is why you came, so I can serve you. His response was not to say, you've ob- Lord, you've obviously showed up in our service today so that you can honor us so that you can bless us, so that you can heal and restore and do great things for us. Those things happen in the presence of the Lord by default because of who he is. But Abraham says, my purpose is not to sit here and serve you so that you can do a great deed for me. You came this way so I could serve you because you are who you are and you deserve it and nothing else needs to come my way except that you would be here. We've got to remember, and I've said this many, many times, we are not the main character in our own story. And even here, Abraham realizes he is not the main character in his own story here. The account of his life is not about Abraham. It's about a God who is faithful to pursue him. God is his focus, and his response to God should be our response to God. Lord, I'm so glad you're here. How can I serve you? And not, how can I serve you so long as it's visible? How can I serve you so long as it benefits me? How can I serve you so long as it's something that men will hold in high esteem and that will in turn get me lots of attention and credit for the great thing that I have done? How can I serve you? Let me cook something. Let me run out into the field. Let me get dirty with the shepherds. Let, let, me, let me find dinner and make sure that that's put together for you. Let me do some menial task that a servant could do so that I can make sure that you are served well. The truth is, if the Lord is calling us to serve him, we can't outsource that idea to other people. We have to behave like a servant. The way people are served well is when the servants are faithful. 
I'm not the main character here. I'm a servant of the Most High God. And Abraham knows this, and he addresses God accordingly. And then, so here we see Abraham, this imperfect man. He comes, and he is faithful to serve God, never assuming that God's going to do anything more for him than he has already done. And we see that take place in those first eight verses. And then we're going to look at verse, uh, we're going to start in verse 9, and we're going to read through verse 15 and look at this next section. It should be a fairly quick one. Where is your wife, Sarah? They asked him, these three men, the Lord. There in the tent, Abraham answers. Then the Lord said, I will certainly come back to you in about a year's time, and your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Now, Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent behind him. Abraham and Sarah were old and getting on in years, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. So she laughed to herself. After I've become shriveled up and my Lord is old, will I have delight? But the Lord asked Abraham, why did Sarah laugh, saying, Can I really have a baby when I'm old? Is anything impossible for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will come back to you, and in about one year she will have a son. But Sarah denied it. Oh, I did not laugh, she said, because she was afraid. But the Lord replied, Yes, you did laugh. We've heard this passage. The, the Lord is being served by Abraham and being treated well and being, being properly hosted as he should be in Abraham's home. And we see this passage here where the first question that God asks and as we're getting into the, the actual meat of the conversation, he says, where is Sarah? Why did God ask this question? Surely he knew where Sarah was. Sarah would not have been with the men because it was the custom of the time that, that male visitors did not see the women of the house. That was common, so she would have been in the tent or on the other side of some sort of dividing curtain that would have kept her separate. But it would have been fairly thin. They're nomadic people. These are not thick, soundproofing walls that were put up. It's a curtain of some sort, but uh, the, the Lord asks, where is Sarah? The reason he asked this question is because he wants to remind Abraham of something. It's just been a short period of time since he's changed their names. And God is about to reiterate the promise to Abraham. In fact, he's about to give him a bit more detail than he's seen up to this point. And he's reminding Abraham who Sarah is. We learned last week she is a princess. A princess because of the name that God gave her and who God declared that she is. She's the daughter of of the king and she's one that will bear sons for a great kingdom where is sarah it's not a question about her location it's a reminder of who she is in light of what the lord is about to say to abraham and in verse 10 the lord confirms the promise to abraham and this time specifically he gives a timeline in which sarah is going to become pregnant See, Abraham is faithful, and Abraham is a servant, and likewise, God is faithful to fulfill the promise. If we serve God faithfully, he is faithful to do for us everything he has promised. Now, some of us want that to mean he's promised us a certain thing, a certain job, a certain position, a certain opportunity. But if all that he's promised us is eternity with him, he will be faithful to fulfill that, and we should serve him faithfully in order to receive it. We finish the race that's placed before us, says Paul. And we don't run it because we're trying to get the biggest blessings. We run it because we want to finish and receive the promise of God, no matter whether we feel that promise is big and esteemed enough or not. If all God ever did was promise you eternity, if all he did was promise you he would save you from death, hell, and the grave. We just celebrated that this week. If that's the only promise he's made you, we still have to live faithfully like servants. And God will be faithful to fulfill his part if we will faithfully serve him. Something that we don't often think of in these terms, but we don't have the power to, to derail the plans of God. God is going to fulfill his plan and get his purpose done. Some of you have heard bits and pieces of my testimony, and I, I don't give a lot of I don't give a lot of lip service to what wickedness and evil took place in my life in the periods of time that I was not following the Lord, but I am open about the fact that I've had a couple of spans in my life where I deliberately stepped away from the Lord, and I had, I had the very foolish and very ridiculous idea that I could do some wicked things that would prevent God from being able to use me for the things he wanted me to do. 
And there are many people who would say that's about as wicked as it gets. My, my heart is broken when I talk about it. In fact, I shared my testimony this week a couple of times, one time online and once with someone else privately. And I find myself in tears nearly every time when I talk about how I found a, a point in time when I just completely, deliberately abandoned the church and ministry and God and made the decision that I was going to ruin myself so that he wouldn't force me to be identified with those people or do the things he wanted me to do. And I knew better. And I've experienced firsthand. And I've not, I've not lived a whole life, so I'm, I pray for grace, but I know there's a very real possibility that I've not yet seen all the consequences for those decisions that I made because Scripture tells us that it's worse for those who know better. I've preached and taught that recently. But despite my best efforts, I don't have the power to derail the plans and the promises of God. I can make my road from where I am to where God wants his work done harder on myself. But I'm not powerful enough to undo what he's declared will happen. And that is a theme that we see in Abraham's life and in the life of many other Christians in the course of Scripture whether they call themselves Christians or not. Don't, don't Bible police me over that term. People that are in a relationship with the Lord, people that are serving the Lord, we see there's a running theme that we can't derail God's plans. We aren't powerful enough to change what God has declared will happen because he is going to get his work accomplished. There's not any question. It's just a matter of us deciding in our personal lives how difficult are we going to make it on ourselves. But we're certainly not going to wreck or ruin ourselves or our situation to the point that God cannot do what he said. If we could, God would be a liar and we would be proven to be more powerful than God, and we know that's not true. So the Lord confirms his promise to Abraham, this time specifically giving a timeline in which Sarah will become pregnant. And then in verse 11, for the sixth time, for the sixth time, <laughs> Scripture points out how old Abraham and Sarah are. Now, most of you know that my wife and I had our third child, oh, just a little over three years ago. Well, I guess, actually, we're approaching four years ago. We were already old. We got picked on quite a bit about that. That was the Lord's plan, not mine, to have a child in our 40s. And God be praised for his wisdom and his insight and what he understands and knows needs to happen that I don't understand. Because I can tell you having a child in my 40s is much harder than having a child in my 20s. And my wife would agree with me if she were in the room tonight and not with those children downstairs. For the sixth time here, Scripture points out how old Abraham and Sarah are. Ninety-nine years old. God bless you, Abraham. And Scripture points this out because another running theme here is God does not want anyone to be able to question whether or not he did the work. Sarah is far past the age of childbearing. Abraham is past the age that whether he's capable or not, he's probably not interested in having more tiny children run around the house. And when the time comes that the Lord fulfills his promise, there can be no question that it's his time, his plan and his work getting accomplished. The quickest way that you can find out whether something is the work of God or not is whether you can figure out if you were able to do it yourself or not. Did I make this happen or did God make it happen? Is it a self-fulfilling prophecy because I've just taken the things that are naturally occurring sets of circumstances that I engineered or walked myself into that I'm saying, oh, well, it seems that everything I wanted has fallen into place? Or is it truly something that there's no way other than God that this could have worked out? Was it beyond you and, ab and beyond your ability? God doesn't want there to be any question. If it's a miracle, he wants credit and glory for it. If it's his work, he wants credit and glory for it. If it's something that he promised to do, he wants to make sure he gets all of the credit for it and not us. His promise to you is going to be something that you can't do and can't engineer. And if you try to and you try to get the credit for it, even if you pull it off, it will not be sufficient. And it will not be God's way. We've already seen Abraham and Sarah fail in this very way. We have come up with a way that we're going to make God's plan happen. Nope, not going to work. Abraham and Sarah are old. And this gets pointed out because God wants the credit for what's about to happen. And as this conversation is happening about what God plans to do, Abraham, or Abraham and, and the Lord are talking, and Sarah is listening through this thin curtain where she's inside the tent. She's eavesdropping, and the, words, the, the word that this commonly gets translated to is it says, Sarah laughed 
But it was a specific kind of laughter. If you look it up, it means mocking. <laughs> really? <laughs> okay, Lord, if you say so. There was a tone. She obviously felt, as some of us would say, she felt some kind of way about that. Sarah's eavesdropping, and she laughs, and she's to herself mocking the plans of God. Oh, really? At my age? At my age, will will I have, I'm, I'm shriveled up and old, my husband is old, will I truly have this delight? Yeah. That word delight, and the children are not here tonight, I can say this as it is, that word delight means only one thing. It's used five times in Scripture. It's used exactly the same way all five times. It specifically relates to and means sexual pleasure that a woman has. Sarah says, huh, I'm going to do that again? Sure I am. Yeah, that'll be the day. But then in verse 13, we see something interesting happen here. Sarah has mocked God. She's had a bad attitude. And it would seem like a small thing. There are no small things in the Lord. It would seem like a small thing. And in verse 13, God holds Abraham responsible for Sarah's skepticism and mockery. Why did Sarah laugh when I said I would do something great for you, Abraham? I don't know. She's over there. Why don't you ask her? No, I asked you. Why? Does this sound familiar? Remember the Garden of Eden? Adam was held responsible for the actions of his wife and all humanity, all of mankind, because Adam played a part in. Adam had a responsibility for his wife. Men, you're responsible for your wives before God. Men, if you're sitting in homes and pretending to be the husband, you're in a dangerous place. The Lord called for a union that resembles the one between himself and the church, and it's because there's a responsibility that has to be taken. Don't enter into the relationship lightly and don't pretend to be the one responsible. There will come a time when God will look and say, if you have tried to behave as a husband, you will be held responsible as one. And if you have done things right and you're in that relationship, your house needs to be in order because when you are the husband, the Lord will say, what has happened in this situation? You had a responsibility to me. It's not that men are greater than or less than. It's that God has said this is a role and I will hold you accountable for this. Regardless of what your social and culture or social structure and culture wants to tell you, the Lord will look at the man in the house and say, what has happened with your wife and your children and why? I need an account for this. Women, as long as you're submitted to your husbands in the way that the church submits to Christ, you're off the hook. Because your husband is responsible. I'm not saying you're off the hook for your personal behavior. Between you and the Lord, you will deal with some things, but your husband will answer in a way that you will not because his responsibility is for how the household is running. He's responsible for those relationships. Adam was declared guilty for Eve's sin as well as his own part. Abraham was called on the carpet. Why does your wife doubt what I've said? Have you not taught her to believe? Have you not established an atmosphere in your home where we trust in the word of the Lord? Is she not submitted to you in the way that the church should be submitted to God? See, part of Adam's sin, we talked about this once before, and now the implication here, part of Abraham's issue is allowing things to happen, following the lead of the woman rather than leading by God's standard yourself. Fellas, it's a big deal. It's important. God holds Abraham responsible for Sarah's skeptical attitude. And the Lord drives home how important this is. He says, is there anything impossible for me? Is there anything that I can't do? Are you on board with this idea? Does she behave this way because you also believe this way? Is there anything impossible for me? God's not playing about this. And it's not a having a thumb down on somebody. It's not a, an oppressive leadership situation. It's a matter of recognizing what are we responsible for, men. 
what and who are we responsible for, and are we prepared to answer for that before the Lord? The Lord says, is anything impossible for God? Is there anything that I can't do? Make sure that you and everyone you're responsible for are aware that there's nothing I can't do. And Sarah then feels the need to speak up. And she says, I didn't laugh. And if you look at the translation of that, it basically says, I was only joking. I wasn't mocking you, Lord. And God replied, "Mm -mm. no, I know your heart. And he literally says, you did not take my word seriously. You did laugh. You did mock. And that's not acceptable to me. The difficult little passage there to realize what is the role. And even here in the Old Testament when we're under the law, God is holding intent up to the standard of law here. We know in the New Testament, and I'm going to talk about this later, even in the course of this passage, we're going to look at the way that God has extended the law to include the heart. But even here we see that the intent has been foundational. It's been included in the idea that we have to follow the law, even before there was the grace of the New Testament, because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he doesn't change. I was not mocking you, Sarah said. God said, oh, no, you were. You weren't taking me seriously, and that's a problem. The conversation is over there and moves on to something else. Let's look, let's look at verses 16 through 33, and we may end after this. We'll just see how far we get. The men got up from there after this conversation. They looked out over Sodom, and Abraham was walking with them to see them off. And then the Lord said, should I hide what I'm about to do from Abraham? This is interesting. The Lord, again, having a conversation. Is he talking to himself? No. There are three people, him and two angels, whatever entities these are. God is talking to some other heavenly creatures. The Lord says, should I hide what I'm about to do from Abraham? Because Abraham is to become a great and powerful nation, and all the nations of earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will command his children and his house after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. This is how the Lord will fulfill Abraham as he has promised him. Then the Lord said, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is intense, and their sin is extremely serious. I will go down to see if what they have done justifies the cry that has come up to me. If not, I will find out. Then the men turned from there and went toward Sodom, while Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Abraham stepped forward and said, will you really sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away instead of sparing the place for the sake of those 50 righteous who are in it? You could not possibly do such a thing to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. You could not possibly do that. Won't the judge of all the earth do what is just? The Lord said, if I find 50 righteous people in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham answered, since I've ventured to speak to the Lord, even though I am dust and ashes, suppose 50 righteous lack five. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of those five? The Lord replied, I won't destroy it if there are 45. Then he spoke again. Suppose there are 40 found there. And the Lord answered, I will not do it on account of 40. And then he says, let the Lord not be angry and I will speak further. Suppose there are 30 found there. And the Lord answered, I will not do it if I find 30. And then Abraham said, since I have ventured to speak to the Lord, suppose 20 are found there. And he replied, I will not destroy it on account of 20. Then he said, Lord, let not yourself be angry. And I will speak one more time. Suppose there are ten found there. And the Lord answered, I will not destroy it on account of ten. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he departed, and Abraham returned to his place. Now, that's a long passage. Let's look at it briefly. We already know from previous chapters that Sodom was known as being a wicked town. We first saw this at the point when Abraham and Lot decided to split up because they were no longer able to live happily together as large as their flocks and slaves and groups of people and families had become and we saw as lot was looking over this beautiful valley but sodom sat on the edge of it and it was known to be wicked we've known for quite a while we learn here that god is planning to visit sodom personally and evaluate their sin to see in verse 21 
is the outcry that has come out against them that he's heard? Is it justified? As I was reading this, it, it struck me. I, I wondered, where did that cry come from? Who is crying out to say that Sodom is wicked? Where, where's the origin of this cry? And as I was reading and studying over that, I realized it's, it's the victims. It's the victims of wickedness that cry out to the Lord. Do you remember Abel? The story of his brother Cain killing him. And as the Lord is speaking to Cain, he says, the blood of your brother calls out to me from the ground. It's the same language. There is an outcry of the victims. The blood of those you have wronged cries out to me. A cry has gone up to the Lord because of the wickedness that is happening upon the earth and the Lord is investigating to see, is it justified? Is it truly wickedness that is happening when this cry goes up to me? Because the Lord hears those cries of those victimized people, of those people treated poorly, treated unrighteously, treated unjustly. And he responds. And because of the reputation of Sodom, the Lord or Abraham knows full well what the Lord is going to find but he also remembers my nephew Lot. When we, saw, when we parted ways, he was left in that valley, and he was taken prisoner because he was in that valley. And I, I rescued him, and I brought him and all of his people and all of his livestock and all of his things back, and we restored him to his land, but it's still there near that place that's wicked. Lord, Abraham is thinking to himself, I know what you're going to find when you go, and I need to talk to the Lord about this. I know it's important to the Lord, says Abram. We're going to see how well Abraham knows what's important to the Lord. You look at the conversation that happens in those 10 verses between verse 23 and verse 33, and Abraham makes a plea to the Lord. Will you find, if you find 50 righteous people there, will you spare the city? And this bargaining goes down until we get down to 10. And God actually entertains and listens he actually entertains and listens to this plea, this plea bargain, if I can call it that, from Abraham for these people. God is listening when his people talk to him. Does that mean that God's necessarily going to change his mind? No. It does not mean that God is going to change his mind. But look at how this conversation actually went. God's listening and here's, here's how it goes. God says, I'm going to evaluate things to see how I plan to respond. And even knowing that he had a course of action in mind, he's willing to first listen to Abraham. You look at Abraham's entire dialogue in that ten, ten set, set of ten verses, and Abraham asks the Lord respectfully, with a good attitude, and as a faithful servant, and for the right reasons. He's obviously passionate when we look at that passage, he's obviously very charged with emotion. Let's go back and look at this briefly. Abraham says, will you really sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Will you really do that instead of sparing the place for the sake of the righteous people you find? You couldn't possibly do such a thing, Lord. Killing the righteous and the wicked together and treating them alike as if they're the same. You couldn't possibly do that. Won't the judge of earth do what is just. Abraham's got a, an impassioned plea here, but he's not disrespectful. He's not giving the Lord an ultimatum. He's not saying, if you'll do this, then I'll do that, or how dare you, or what gives you the right. Respectfully, good attitude. And he's already proven himself a faithful servant. And we see here he asks for the right reasons. What's the reason that he brings up? Righteousness. It's the very thing that Abraham's faithfulness gets counted to him for. We've read about that already in the New Testament. <coughs> God listens to the people that are faithful to him, and he hears you if you speak from a place of righteousness and faithfulness. Abraham has God's heart because he is a righteous man because of his faithfulness. Tell me that won't mess with your doctrine when you look at the mistakes that Abraham has made. In light of the introduction of tonight's message, tell me that won't mess with you a little bit when we realize that 
from the Lord's perspective, that's what faithfulness and righteousness can look like. God listens to those who are faithful and righteous and ask the way Abraham asked. God was willing to listen to Abraham because of who he was and what he asked for. God is also willing to preserve on account of the righteous. Abraham did not say, God, will you save the city if I can find some good people in it? There are lots of people who, from the perspective of heaven, are doing great wickedness, and a lot of those people are sitting in the churches, and they're filling pulpits, and they're living lives of, of, of a kind of Christianity that is self-serving and is not pleasing to the Lord. There are plenty of people doing good things who are not righteous. Abraham didn't ask God to preserve the city on account of good people. He asked him on account of the righteous because God will always preserve the righteous and the faithful. He does it again and again in Scripture. And I referenced this a moment ago. Let's look at it more in detail right now. God judges things. God judges faithfulness and righteousness on the heart, not always on behavior, because my flesh is weak and fails and breaks, and my mind makes bad decisions like Abraham. But Abraham continued to press on and follow the Lord and be teachable and correctable and had the heart of the Lord in his own heart to pursue, even when he realized he'd fallen short of that. Even when he deliberately made a mistake and then said, I need to correct this, God, I'm sorry. God judges things like that on the heart, not necessarily on every single tiny behavior. That's not an excuse to sin. That's the perspective of heaven that says, when sin inevitably happens, not go in sin because it doesn't matter. When sin inevitably happens, God will judge your heart. And this is where I'm, I'm going to give you the reference. Matthew 22, 37 and Matthew 5, 28 are where I pull this from. I'll read this in a moment. But Christ expanded the law to include the heart. Matthew twenty two thirty seven. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, not just with all your behavior and all your law keeping. And Matthew 5, 28 says, if a man looks with lust in his heart, he's committed adultery with that woman in his heart. Suddenly, not just the act of adultery is punishable, but the thought of adultery is on par with the action because the Lord sees the heart. And the heart is the place I should love him from. So if I've let sin into that, it's just as wrong as if my behavior were not good. If we would get what's in here right first, eventually this will follow. We've spent way too much time working on this. And worrying about whether it's covered in tattoos or eating the right foods or wearing the right clothes or living the right lifestyle in every single aspect. If we would just get our heart right, eventually this will come along. God's example with Abraham again and again and again and again has been to make a distinction between behavior and faithfulness. To make a distinction between behavior and righteousness. And here again, we see this reference to to that big churchy word, sanctification, the long process of becoming Christ-like. Abraham was faithful, and that counted to him as righteousness. God wasn't going to change his mind, but he's going to listen to Abraham, and he's, he understands Abraham has his heart because Abraham's calling for the preservation of righteous. God listens to Abraham, and is willing to preserve the city on account of any righteousness he might find. Now, the truth is God knew he wasn't going to find anything righteous because God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. All he sees all things, knows all things. I mean, he's God, but he honored his faithful servant and acknowledged that Abraham had his heart because Abraham knew that what mattered to God was the righteous. And sometimes confirming that we know the heart is the most important thing. In this exchange, it was the most important thing. It's like praising your children because you realize they get it. I certainly want my children's behavior. And I had a, a, a pastor friend of mine, a pastor I sat under for a while, as a matter of fact, who used to say, I, I want your heart, not just your behavior, because you can teach your kids to behave the right way, but if their heart is not in it, there will come a time when they will depart and their behavior will change because their heart is not right. But there are other times when you watch your children and you go, you have, the thing you have done is the wrong thing, but I understand your intent and your purpose in it, and that tells me that I have taught you something that has gotten into your heart. And we can work on how to make your behavior and your heart line up, but it's much easier 
or much more important, rather, to get your heart right, even if it is sometimes easier to just correct behavior. The Lord, if nothing else, is affirming in this conversation with Abraham, you've got my heart because you're absolutely right. Righteousness is what matters to me. And because you have been righteous and asked in righteousness, if I find righteousness among those people, then sure, I'll preserve the righteous. I've got more notes tonight, but I think it's more than I can get through in a reasonable amount of time. So we're going to stop right there and we'll look at chapter 19 next week. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and call it a night. Father, I thank you this evening for the chance to be here with your people. I thank you for this teaching. I hope that I have spoken well. Lord, I pray that your spirit has been with me. I pray, Lord, and I, th I thank you, Lord, for sustaining me as I'm not feeling well. I'm glad that your purpose has been accomplished here. And I pray, Lord, that you will erase in the hearts and minds of people any mistakes that I've made in the course of, of teaching when my body is weak, but my spirit wants to honor you. I pray, Lord, that we will take something away from this that brings us closer to you, that we will, we will come closer to you because of our time having heard this, that we will have a better understanding of your perspective but because we've looked at the great life of your servant, Abraham, who was righteous, who was faithful, who was responsible even when it was difficult, who always came back to you. I thank you for the, the, the rights and privileges that you've instilled in us as your children, but more importantly, I thank you that we have come to a place where we can understand what truly matters to you is not just that we act right, but that our heart is right with you. Lord, be with us as we go. Keep us safe. Let your work be done because of the power of your spirit in our hearts not because of anything great we've attempted to do here and keep us safe till you bring us back again. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here with me wherever you happen to have been online or here. I look forward to seeing you again soon.